So it's the latest Ethereum sharding design that uh, proposed by Dankra. He's here today uh, in 2021. And so in this new design that it unlocked so many uh, scaling, um, I mean, the challenge. And it's not the, now the sharded data, it, we don't we shard it at the data blocks rather than having uh, many EVM shard chains. But the dark sharding protocol is, there are still some um, technical challenge that we need to fix. So right uh, before we have the full dark sharding, uh, Proto is also here, and uh, many of us, um, they uh, collaborated and figured out that we can have a more um, feasible solutions that in the short term, to address um, the this um, scaling, and it can greatly scale the Ethereum with their two uh, rollups in in the very near future. So that's the proto and Dunkra, and this the proto Dunkra sharding. Okay, so there are some many, uh, many uh, common features in both EIP four 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 and the the four Dunk sharding. So today we will uh, break down these topics and you can see that they both have the KZG commitment. So um, then Clark will introduce the cryptography part uh, first. And they also have the blob transactions. So we will also introduce like what is blob today. And fee market is also the uh, shared common features here. And um, so the challenging part of dunk sharding is the uh, PBS and the DAS. So we will also talk about it later. Okay, there's the agenda today. We have a very rich agenda in the next two hours. So yeah, and that will, I will hand it to dunk next to introduce the cryptography in dunk sharding. So if you can go through this, you will know everything. <laughs> okay. That's the cool. thing. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Cool. So um, I will uh, uh, be giving an introduction um, to KCG commitments. Um, uh, I'll be starting with uh, giving a motivation to um, um, to understand why why we need these advanced polynomial commitments and uh, why we can't do all this uh, simply with uh, Merkle roots, which we are all uh, quite familiar with. Um, uh, so I'll be going through the motivation. Uh, I'll uh, quickly go um, uh, give a, yeah an overview over the. Finite fields that we uh, that we use in order to commit to uh, polynomials. Uh, um, I will kind of motivate KTG commitments as like hashes of polynomials. Um, then go to the actual meet, which is um, how do uh, KTG commitments work. And finally, because we um, also use these a lot in our construction now, um, I will be going through the technique. Uh, uh, which I call random evaluation, which is um, um, uh, a nice trick that you can often use uh, to to work with polynomials, and that uh, that makes a lot of um, uh, things that you want to do with polynomials a lot more efficient. Um, cool. So let's talk about uh, data available assembling and erasure coding. Um, so. Um, so, so what's data availability sampling? So the idea is uh, we somehow have um, a large uh, blob of data, and um, and what we're working on is scalability. So scalability means that somehow we have to make it so that a node has to do uh, do less work to achieve the same thing that we do today. So right now, every node ensures that all Ethereum blocks are available by downloading all the blocks. 
Um, that's just an implicit part of it. Like it seems obvious because right now you also execute the full blocks, um, but um, it's one of the things that don't scale in the current Ethereum system. So we need a way um, to to reduce this um, this workload, but we want to do it in such a way that um, we don't lose any of the security that this provides, and that that's what makes this tricky. And um, so like. The, the basic idea is, okay, what if we take our um, data blob and uh, we just take um, uh, uh, that random samples um, of uh, the data are available. Um, so if we do this naively, if we just take the data as it is, then uh, this, this, does not, uh, this does not really work um, uh, because uh, even, even missing a tiny amount of data um, is catastrophic potentially for a blockchain, um, but uh, but best by by doing random sampling, you can never find out whether a tiny bit is missing. You can only see whether major parts of the data are missing. So what we'll need to do is, in order for this technique to work, um, is we need to encode the data in such a way that um, uh, that even having some parts of the data, say 50%, is enough to guarantee that all the data is available. Um, and so the way we do this is we extend the data using um, a so-called Reed solomon code. And um, uh, if you know a little bit about uh, polynomials, like um, a Reed solomon code is nothing else but, but extending um, the data using polynomials. So what you do is, let's say, like in the simple example, um, we have uh, four blocks of um, original data. And what we'll do is we'll, um, we will take these four as evaluations of, of a polynomial. There will always be a polynomial of degree three that goes uh, through these four points. And then uh, we can evaluate this polynomial on four more points. And what this means, because four points always determine a polynomial of degree three, that any of these four points are enough to reconstruct exactly the same polynomial. It does not matter which four points you have. And so this, this is like, this is the basis of erasure coding. And now, because of this, the data availability sampling idea that we had here um, actually works. Because now I don't need to ensure that every single bit of the data is available. Now I only need to know that at least 50% of the data are available, and then I can always reconstruct everything. Yeah, sure. Now double the data? Yes, yeah, we have doubled the data. Like 50% no. So that's the trick. So um, we do random sampling. So as an example, we query 30 random blocks. So if the data is not available, that means the attacker needs to have withheld 50%. Because if they submitted more than 50% to the, to the network, it's all there. OK, so if it's not available, then each of these samples, because we used local randomness to query them, has only a 50% chance um, of succeeding. So that means, in aggregate, the probability that all of them succeed is now 2 to the minus 30, which is 1 in a billion. So this is why it scales. You don't need to ensure, you don't need to query 50% of the data. You only need to do like a tiny number of random samples. And this number is constant, so it does not depend on the amount of data. OK. So what if we now we have this polynomials polynomial? So we have these evaluations. This was the original data, d0 to d3. And then we have these um, extensions that we computed. And we just compute an, a normal Merkle tree on top of that and use this root as our data availability root. So the problem with this is that Merkle roots do not um, tell you anything about the content of the data. So like it could be anything. So in this case, let's say an attacker wants to trick our data availability system. They could just not use this uh, polynomial extension, but they could just put random data. So basically, in coding terms, they have provided an invalid code. Um, what that means is that um, any uh, if, if you get four different chunks of this data, you would always get a different polynomial. So you would like, so consensus is all about agreeing on like something, like, and, and in this case, we wouldn't actually have agreed on something because the data is different depending on which, um, on, on which of these um, samples we've got. 
So the only way to make this work is if we if we add uh, fraud proofs to the system, where you basically prove uh, prove that um, that someone has provided this invalid code. Um, but that uh, that isn't great. So that that has some problems. Um, they add a lot of complexity, in particular in this case, because this is about the layer one itself, it would make our system very, very difficult to design because now validators um, would need to basically wait for this fraud proof in order to know which block to even vote for. So it would be kind of very iffy to design this. Um, so the interesting question is what if we could find some kind of commitment um, that instead always commits to a polynomial? So we always know that the encoding is valid. Cool, and that is why we will introduce KCG commitments. And we need to start a little bit earlier, so I will start from by introducing finite fields a little bit for those that, who are not familiar with it. Okay, so I can do it from here. Um, okay, so what's a finite field? Okay, so uh, to understand uh, what a field is, um, it's basically think about um, rational, real, or complex numbers, which you've probably learned about. And um, just remind yourself, like, we have basic operations that we can do in them. We can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And we can do that, do all of these except division by zero, so that you're, you're, always, um, uh, you're always able to, to do these operations. And you have some, uh, you have some laws, like uh, they are associative, commutative, distributive. Basically, just think of like, I mean, I, I could give like the formal laws here, but I don't think that would be the best illustration because you're already very familiar with these rules when you work with um, rational or real numbers. And the big difference for finite fields is that unlike, um, uh, unlike these uh, these fields that we're very familiar with, they which all have an infinite number of elements, they have a finite number of elements. And that's quite important because otherwise we can't encode them with a finite number of bits, which is yeah kind of like something that we that we need to be able to do. Um, so the, yeah, so that means that each element can be represented using the same number of bits. And um, as an example. Uh, on, of showing how this works. Here's, here's a very small finite field. This is F5. And basically, the way it works is you, uh, you take uh, the five numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and, um, and you, you use your normal um, integer operations um, to compute um, like the addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Uh, but whenever you've done that, you take the result and do um, take the remainder after division by five. So you take it modulo five. And then um, when you write it out, um, basically you'll find that for each element, so we haven't yet defined like how do we do division. Um, so if you write down the multiplication table, you'll find that each element has actually an inverse. So basically, um, if you take, uh, for example, here like a two, then you can see that two times three is six, but modulo five, that's one. So it has an inverse. Okay, that's nice. And like then the other way around, three, the inverse is two. And for four, um, if you take four times four, it's 16. And it's uh, um, and that's that's again modulo five. That's one, um, and so we've just found like by just listing these these numbers that um, every element has an inverse. And um, the reason for that that is that five is a prime number. So whenever we to take these modulo operations, modulo um, a prime number, um, then then we'll find that we actually have a finite field. Um, and so that that's our finite fields. Um, um, except that the fields we're going to be working with in practice will have a lot more elements. So the, the prime that we're going to be using will have 255 bits, so it's like a very, very big number because, yeah, we want to be able to represent a lot of numbers in this field. Cool. Okay, so let's think about um, hashing polynomials. Okay, so a quick reminder, what's a polynomial? Um, so a polynomial is an expression um, of this form. So it's like a sum over some coefficients, fi, and, uh, and, uh, and terms of the uh, times uh, term of the form x to the power of i. Um, so the property is that um, uh, this, it has to be finite sum, so it's a sum from uh, 0 to n. Um, n we, is, is the degree of the polynomial. And um, 
Uh, and basically, the other important thing that you have to always uh, remind yourself, there can never be any negative terms. So you cannot have x to the minus 1. It's only ter uh, terms of the form x to the power of 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Um, yeah. And, um, and each polynomial um, defines a polynomial function. So it's important to distinguish between the two. So a polynomial is just an expression of this type. So it's just, a, you could think of it even as a list of coefficients. Um, and like, and then it defines a function. But like, for example, in some fields, um, like in finite fields, you, you will have the property that the same polynomial function can have many polynomials corresponding to it because there's only a finite number of, of functions, but there's an infinite number of um, polynomials. Um, this, this property you don't have in infinite fields. Um, and so the, the cool property that polynomials have is that for any k points, there will always be a polynomial of degree k, k minus 1 or lower that goes through all of these points. And, um, and this polynomial is unique. Um, and the other um, uh, properties, property is that a polynomial of degree um, uh, n that is not constant um, has at most n zeros. Okay. Um, so, what 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 would be cool if we could imagine a, a hash function for polynomials? So let's imagine that we could have a hash function um, that uh, takes a polynomial um, and hashes it. Okay, that's easy. But it should have a have an extra um, property, which is that we can construct proofs of evaluation. So basically, what we want is that for any z, so any point, um, uh, we want uh, we can evaluate those polynomials, compute y equals f of z, and we want um, some um, some proof that this is correct. So that that um, that would be um, an interesting hash of polynomials that gives us something new. And um, and this this hash and the proof um, should be small in some sense. So um, here, here's some idea. Okay, um, what if we just choose a random number? For example, let's say we choose the number three. Um, if we uh, want to hash a polynomial, we just evaluate it um, at this random number um, three. So we say we put uh, x equals three. Um, here's a couple of um, examples how, how that works if we uh, stay in our small field, F5, which we defined before with just those five numbers. So if our polynomial is x squared plus 2x plus 4, then the hash is like x squared 9 plus 2x 6 plus 4, modulo 5 is 4. And then here's a second example, so a bit of a, a bigger polynomial, modulo 5, in this case it's 0. Okay. Um, that, that seems a bit stupid to just do it at one point. But the interesting thing is, if our modulus has 256 bits, which is what we're going to work with in practice, it's actually extremely unlikely that two randomly chosen polynomials have the same hash in quotation marks, just like it is for a normal hash function, right? So uh, that, that, that's an interesting property. Like, I mean, it seems like a very stupid and simple operation, but in some ways, in one way, it already has like a property, like a hash. Okay. Um, okay, so if we accept this for now, then uh, let's have a look at some of the things we could, we could do with it. Um, so for example, we can actually um, add two hashes of polynomials. Um, so like if we, have, uh, if we have the hash of, uh, the, oops, if the, the take of the hash of two functions, uh, hash of f and f hash of g, then the hash will just be the sum, like the hash of the uh, sum of the functions will just be the the hash of f and plus the hash of g, um, and that's because of this homomorphic property, which is trivial if you write it out in polynomials. Um, and um, the same is true if you um, uh, uh, if you multiply two of these polynomial hashes. And that's just because polynomial evaluation itself is a homomorphic property. Like if you, you can either first add two polynomials, then evaluate them, or you can like do, uh, evaluate them and then add the result. 
um, and the same for multiplication. So it has some really cool properties if we could use this as a hash function. Uh, but there's one problem. Um, uh, if, if you use this, um, then if someone knows this random number, right, then they could easily create a collision of this polynomial hash function. Because um, while for random polynomials it's very unlikely that they evaluate to the same point, it is very easy to create like manually two polynomials that evaluate to the same value at this random number. Um, so it doesn't quite work um, as a hash function as we know it. Um, but what um, it would be different if somehow instead we could put this random number into a black box. So if we could uh, if we could find a way of computing with these finite field elements, um, but instead of giving everyone who wants to evaluate this hash function, giving them the actual number, you give them a black box. Um, so like we, we said, we assume we have a cryptographic way of putting a number into a black box. Um, then we give them um, our random number S, and we give them also like the random number S squared and S to the power of three, but all of them only in the black box. Um, and we do it in such a way, like this black box needs to have the property that you can multiply it with another number, and you can add two of these, but you cannot multiply two numbers in a black box. Um, so if that, if you could do that, um, then this would actually work, because now the attacker would not be able um, to like create these two polynomials, because they don't know, they don't know this, this number. Um, and so they, they cannot, um, they cannot craft handcraft the polynomials that so that they evaluate uh, to the same uh, number at that point. And uh, basically, the cool thing is that um, elliptic curves actually um, give you give you exactly that. So um, uh, elliptic curves um, are basically uh, you, you you can think of them as a way of uh, creating black box finite field elements. And the finite field that you have to use is the uh, curve order of that elliptic curve. So if we have um, an elliptic curve, um, which we call G1, uh, why we need this index G1, we'll come to later, but it's just elliptic curve um, that has a generator, um, which means that that's a point so that the um, if you if you add that po point again and again, um, it will generate uh, your whole curve. And um, the the order of the curve is p, so that's the number of points. Um, and then basically we have the property that uh, that x times g, um, where x is a finite field element, x times g one, um, is basically this black box. And the reason for that is that it is hard. To compute so-called discrete logarithms, so it's um, it's difficult. Like when you when you have computed this x times g1, um, it is uh, it is difficult um, to to co to compute x from that point. Um, so that's that's a cryptographic assumption. And so if we have that, um, then if we take uh, two um, if we took two elliptic curve elements, um, g and h. Um, then we can uh, multiply them uh, with field elements, like we can compute x times g, we can add, add the two, g plus h, and we can compute linear combinations like x times g plus y times h, but what we can't compute is, uh, we, can't, we can't, without computing the discrete logarithm, which is hard, we can't compute something like g times h. And so, um, just like we uh, we said before, like we we want this black box, so we will introduce the notation um, like x and squared brackets one for saying that it's in this uh, G1, which is the first elliptic curve we're going to use. We later will need another one. Um, we define that at x times G1. And so basically, when you when you see these square brackets, think of it as like this is a prime field. Uh, element in this black box, in this elliptic curve black box. So we can put stuff inside, and there's no easy way to take them back out. But we can do some computations while they're in there. Cool. And with this, we are ready to introduce KZG commitments. OK. So what we're going to do is we're we're going to introduce a trusted setup. So we're going to 
assume that um, uh, that that someone has um, uh, computed uh, has taken a random number s um, and they've computed inside this block box and given to us um, the powers of s s to the power of uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, in our black box. And actually forget this uh, second one for now, we'll come to that later. Um, and, um, and so uh, if we take a polynomial function, so we've defined this previously, so it looks like this, it's like a sum of coefficients times powers of x, and we define the KZG commitments as, um, as this uh, uh, sum, which we can evaluate. So we take the uh, coefficients and we replace x to the power of i by s to the power of i inside this black box. And here on the left, like so this is something we can obviously compute. It's just a linear combination of these elements which we have been given as part of the trusted setup. And uh, and the cool thing is if you write this out, in, in effect, if it is it is just um, f to the power of s um, evaluated inside this black box. So effectively, we've come back to what we said before. Um, it's just this random evaluation, um, but we've managed to now randomly evaluate this polynomial inside a black box at the secret point. And um, uh, yes, and this this uh, we call the uh, KZG commitment uh, to the function f. And um, now, in order to um, uh, to do interesting things with this, um, we'll need to introduce um, elliptic curve pairing. So this is where we where we get our second group. So we actually need a total of two two groups, and what we'll have is we we have a, a pairing is um, a function from uh, two elliptic curve groups and a target group, which is a different kind of group. It's actually not an elliptic curve, but that's not too important here. And it takes basically these two um, elliptic curve elements, one in G1 and one in G2. And um, it has the cool property that it is um, what we call bilinear. And so that what that means is that um, you can you can compute this um, uh, this uh, linear combination. So for example, if you have the pairing of a times x and z, then it's basically you can take this a out. Um, the same in the second uh, coefficient, and in addition, if you have the sum, then um, uh, then basically um, what it does uh, it it's, it splits into these two. So it's like a distributive law here: x plus y times z is e of x z and e of y z, and the same goes again in the in the second um, parameter of this function. And um, and basically, the cool thing is um, that uh, that this um, the, what what we couldn't do before um, inside. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, what we couldn't do previously between elliptic curve points, um, which is multiply. Um, multiply two elliptic curve points um, is that uh, um, we, we can do in a way between pairings. So if we have uh, one of our points in the in this first group and one in the second group, then due to this bilinear property, we can it actually in in the in the target group it computes something like x times y. Right, so it has this property. We define we define this additional notation for the target group, and then we have this very clean and nice equation that the pairing of um, x as a black box element, y as a black box element, is x times y. So this is very important. Basically, at this point, when we have the pairings, and that's why we really need them, we can do one multiplication. You can we can only do one because afterwards we get this target group element, and that we can't really do anything with. Um, but it turns out that this is actually um, actually enough to do like a lot of very useful stuff in elliptic curves. Okay, now let's assume that we have two polynomials, um, f, uh, f and g, and uh, we commit um, to those polynomials, but we com commit to f um, in g1 and g in, um, in g2 in the different groups. Um, then 
um, then basically this pairing actually lets us uh, compute um, this, like the product of these two commitments, um, in the target group. So basically, um, in this really cool polynomial hash that we have defined, we can now, um, if we commit to them in the in the right groups, we can now uh, multiply two polynomials um, that are committed in this way. So we can multiply the, the commitments without even knowing the polynomials themselves. Okay. Cool. Um, okay, so we will need uh, to introduce one uh, one last missing piece in order to uh, fully come to how um, uh, how KCG commitments work and how we can construct proofs, and that is uh, quotients of polynomials. Okay, so um, let's say we have um, we have a polynomial f of x, and we have two field elements y and z. Um, and then we can uh, we can compute this quotient q of x. Um, this is a rational function, right? So like a polynomial divided by a polynomial is in general a rational function. Um, so you can just see this as like a formal expression. Um, but sometimes this quotient is exact. So sometimes like this quotient will actually result in another polynomial. And basically there's a theorem that's called the factor theorem. Um, it's a relatively elementary math. You've probably learned it in school at some point without calling it that. And that basically says that this is a polynomial, this quotient, um, exactly if f of z equals y. And um, I mean, you, you can kind of see like that um, uh, in one direction because if of x, f, f of x equals y, then um, then at the if you set x equals y, you get a zero here, um, f of z, uh, f of z here, and you get a zero here. So like zero by zero, that can that 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 can only like that, yeah. So you, sorry, if if the quotient is zero at z, that can only work if this is also zero at that z. So like um, so it can only really work if this is uh, this is correct. But the other direction is uh, slightly um, slightly more complicated. So if we restate this, basically we get the fact that we get the polynomial that fulfills the equation, this equation. So we just put the x minus z on the other side. Q of x times x minus z equals f of x minus y, if and only f of z equals y. Okay. Um, and now we get to um, how the KCG proofs work. So if a prover uh, wants to prove that um, f of z equals y, they compute this quotient um, q of x, which is f of x minus y divided by x minus z, and send the proof um, pi, which is uh, q of s, so the commitment to the polynomial, polynomial q. Um, and in order to verify this, um, uh, what the verifier will do is um, they'll take um, this quotient and they will multiply it by the commitment to s minus z and check that this is the same as our original polynomial, the commitment to that, minus y. And sorry, this is unfortunately not very readable on this background um, because if you write it out in this pairing group, then you get... Um, on the right hand side, q of s times s minus z in the target group equals f of s minus y. And this is the same as the second equation. So the cool thing is we can verify this equation because we are able to multiply two polynomial commitments inside uh, using the pairing. And this way we can verify that the quotient was actually computed correctly. Cool, yeah, and that that is basically that that is the that is how KCG commitments work. So, like, just to so yeah, um, so so the idea is just um, if you can compute this this quotient, then you'll be able to find something that fulfills this equation. And using the factor theorem that we mentioned previously, if f of z is not y, then you cannot compute this. It doesn't exist. It's not a polynomial, and we can only commit to polynomials. So yeah, this is the recap on the KCG commitment. We can 
commit to any polynomial using a single element in G1. And um, it is, uh, and this is just the evaluation, evaluation of the polynomial at the secret point S um, inside the black box. Um, we can open the commitment um, at um, any point, so we can compute f of z, um, we, and by computing the quotient q of x, we can um, we can compute this proof, uh, which is q of s in the black box. And in order to verify that proof, we use this pairing equation, and um, and that that uh, shows a verifier that um, this evaluation is correct. Cool. So that is uh, KCG, how KCG commitments work. Now, there's, uh, I want to do something slightly more, which is a technique that we use um, quite a lot. We have even using it in uh, EAP 4844. And so I want to give a quick introduction into how it works, which is uh, the random evaluation trick. Um, okay. Um, so basically, let's recall that KCG commitments are nothing but evaluating a polynomial f at a secant point s inside this elliptic curve black box. And um, so in a way, this is already like a random evaluation. Like, but basically what we've done is we've, we've identified this polynomial using a random evaluation and we kind of, we somehow found that this is good enough to like, um, to hash a polynomial in a, in a way that uh, it's very difficult to create collision. And um, more generally, this random evaluation trick can be used to verify polynomial identities. And uh, the reason for that is the um, schwarz zippel lemma. And I will just uh, formulate it as a more general one, but um, let's say what it says in one dimension. So let's have a um, degree, a polynomial um, of degree less than n that is not uh, identical to zero. So there's one particular polynomial that is zero everywhere. That's just like all zeros, right? That's a very special polynomial. So let's say it's not that. Now let's take um, a random uh, point z in fp. Then the probability that f of z is zero is at most n over p. And that's because it can have at most n zeros. Um, and so this is a very useful thing because um, our p is very, very large, and our degree is relatively small compared to it in our case. So for example, in 4 bls 1281, p is 255 bits. Say we commit to a polynomial of uh, degree 2 to the 12, then this probability is something like 2 to the minus 240. So like it's a very, very small probability. Um, and so here, here's the first way um, in which uh, in which we can use this. So like we have these uh, transaction blobs that um, will define for 4844. So it's like uh, they are commitments to um, polynomials with 4,090 degree 4,095. So in total 4,096 points. And uh, to committing such a, computing such a commitment is not very expensive, but it is expensive. It's like 50 milliseconds to do this. But verifying one KCG proof is um, quite a lot cheaper. It only costs about two milliseconds. So we can use this to our advantage. And so the idea is this. Um, uh, we take our uh, commitment to the polynomial, C, and we take the polynomial, F itself. So what we want to verify is that we have the polynomial that it's given to us. So in this case, we have all the data and we have the commitment. And the naive way, we can just commitment, compute the commitment from the polynomial. But that's expensive. Okay, how can we do it cheaper? Um, we do, uh, we um, compute a random point. And one way to get a random point is actually a very cool technique. It's called uh, fiat Chamir. Um, we take all our inputs. So we compute Z as the hash of the commitment and the polynomial. Why is that kind of random? Because like, if an attacker tries to craft something, if they try to adversarially compute either C or F, it will always change the point Z. So it's very hard for them to find some, like uh, to, to craft them in a way that, that breaks our construction. So basically this is a common technique in, in cryptography um, to, to get something random that the attacker cannot control. And so um, we evaluate this polynomial, y, at, um, at this random point that we've taken. 
and then we compute a KCG proof that f of z equals y. And basically, that won't, then what we'll do is we just add this proof um, to our transaction blob um, wrapper, which is the way we're sending uh, transactions. And then, like to verify this, you compute um, z as this hash. You also compute f of z, which you can do because you have the data for that. And you check the proof pi, the KCG proof. And that's done. And that's much, much cheaper than computing the commitment. Um, so that's one way in which we can use random evaluations to like save us um, a lot of work and um, making things more efficient. Okay. Um, so uh, here, here's another way in which we can use this random evaluation technique. Um, so ZK rollups, um, uh, they uh, use many different um, proof schemes. And so um, only a handful, I don't know if actually there are any right now, um, will use natively uh, KCG commitments over, over BLS 12.381. And so the question is like, um, how do all the other ones make efficient use of our blob commitments that we want to add with 4.844 and then full sharding? Um, because like because computing uh, KCG commitments inside a proof or computing pairings um, that is uh, pretty expensive. Like that 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 um, that's a very expensive operation in a zero knowledge proof. And um, so uh, what we do in this case is basically you have to uh, you you commit to the data in uh, different ways. So we have uh, we have three different inputs. So we have our blob data, which is this function f itself. And um, and uh, we have two different type of commitments now. We have C, which is our blob commitment, which is what we'll use um, inside Ethereum um, uh, for 4844. And um, we have another way of committing to this data, which is using um, the, the the ZK rollups native commitment. So they will, in some way, um, it will also have some way of committing to data that that works well for their zero knowledge proof scheme. Um, scheme. And so in this case, what we'll do is we'll uh, take Z as a hash of um, C and R, like these two different commitments, and um, we will compute Y again as F of Z, and um, we'll add um, uh, pi as a proof that F of Z equals Y. And we'll, we'll add this precompile that allows us in the Ethereum virtual machine to verify that uh, the, the KCG proof uh, pi. Um, so we will know that C, eva C is um, a correct commitment to F, um, and uh, what we'll need to add is uh, to add the proof that R is also a, um, a correct commitment, and uh, and the zk rollup can do that inside the proof. So they will inside the proof. Um, they also have to somehow get C and R as an input and hash them and compute Z, and then they can um, they can uh, evaluate. So they will also have F because the rollup wants to use the data. So F is completely available to them. And uh, they just have to compute um, uh, Y equals F of Z uh, and use some technique to verify that uh, the F is the same as the R, but that's, there are ways to make this easy. And then they uh, can verify that um, they have the same data as was committed through C. So that will um, make it much easier to um, use these commitments in ZK rollups. Cool. Um, and um, yeah, I collected uh, some resources if you want to um, read further on this. Um, so Vitalik uh, wrote a while ago a post on elliptic curve pairings. Um, um, I, uh, because there was a lot of interest in that, I write, wrote uh, some notes on how uh, on this last part, how to use um, KCG commitments um, in ZK rollups. Um, for those who are like kind of uh, skeptical and are like wondering, do we really need um, this like uh, advanced cryptography and trusted setup and so on? Um, Vitalik recently wrote a summary on like what what the difficulties are with um, alternatives uh, to KCG commitments. Um, and um, here, this is uh, if if you uh, want kind of it's it's very similar to this talk, but I I wrote a blog post about KCG commitments. And then, of course, if you want to dive deep, there's the um, case, the original KCG paper. And if you scan this QR code, there will be all these links. Cool. Yeah. 
So I guess we look up the box. My question is if you look at the thing, fresh and is I don't understand. Why, where, where do you want to open it multiple times? So, what we do is basically we're just checking uh, ultimate purchase. Okay. Right. And in the life cycle of the pattern, the same life cycle of the setup. Right. If each time you would have used the pressure and the like. Are you talking about S? Or like the, 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 the trusted setup? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, my problem is what is the practice? So I didn't change. So the students are not in so eventually probably the higher. Right. But this is a cryptographic probability, right? We're talking about, I mean, that's why we're setting the security to 2 to the minus 128. So 2, 200, yeah. Yes, but uh, so we are setting uh, in cryptography, we are setting our um, security parameter already in the assumption that an attacker will do a lot of computation to try to break it, like 2 to the 50, 2 to the 60 or more computation power. This is much, much more than however we ever use it in the, in the actual protocol. So like this is all already covered by the, um, by the cryptographic construction. Um, I mean, you can do it, but the random probability is like the prob probability of randomly hitting that are extremely, extremely low. Like if you, like if you construct it so that the probability, so uh, yeah, yeah, uh, like randomly they are less than two to the minus two hundred or something like that. It's like so low you cannot even like yeah think about it. Yeah. Very good question. You seem to be using about I wonder mm -hmm. how you distinguish something like x to the p minus x from the zero polynomial. x to the p minus x to the p right. from the zero polynomial. Yes. Yeah, no, you can't, but that's fine. Uh, okay, so we are always, because we're limiting the degree of our polynomials, right? So our trusted setup will only go to a certain power, for example, to the power of 12. And inside that space, there's only the zero polynomial. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so like if you have no limits on the polynomial degrees, then it doesn't work, but we always have a limit. Yeah, the question could lead to the yeah. Q&A mm -hmm. time. Okay, and next. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Dankrad, for the math. So, okay, so now we're going to go into the bit more like, kind, kind of like we're in the sky of math and we're kind of like tone it down into like the protocol stuff. So I'm going to start with a small like um, explanation of how all this math stuff go into our protocol and how like, you know, all the extra bandwidth of 4844 travels around and gets verified, then Proto is going to take it and tone it even down into more practical stuff, like how the L2s are going to use the data. And then Ansgar is going to tone it even more down and basically explain how people pay for this data. So, okay. So, basically, um, this is a graph that shows how, um, like, optimi optimism and L2, uh, what is its costs. And you can see that like this blue stuff is the data fees, like how much money they are paying for the like data they put on chain. And the other like white stuff is some other stuff. But you can see that the blue, the data is dominating all the costs. So basically what 4844 is, it's like a, a mechanism that drastically increases the amount of data people can post on chain. 
Um, and this is all it is, right? So, okay, so basically um, what we want to do is we want to increase the amount of data. So um, on this very simple picture, on the left side, you can see uh, our data, which we call blob, because it's a bunch of data that also corresponds to a polynomial. And on the right-hand side, you can see a small thing, a commitment, that represents that data, commits to that data. And the like rough idea is that, you know, commitment goes on chain forever, whereas the blob is kind of like, you know, there for a bit and then disappears. So this is like the high level strategy of how we increase bandwidth. We commit to data, we keep the commitments forever, but the data is ephemeral in a way. Okay. So Let's talk a bit about what this data is, what these blobs are, how do polynomials enter into this picture. Uh, so, okay, this is a polynomial. I think by now you're very familiar with it based on the last talk. Uh, the question is, like, how do we put data into this polynomial? And, like, the basic idea is, you know, you have these coefficients, the a1, a2, a whatever, and each, it, you, you can basically put data into this coefficient. So, you know, if you have some data, uh, one, four, one, six, you can put it in the coefficient. So you make this little polynomial on the bottom. And that's like a very straightforward way to put data into polynomial. So, right. So let's now think of like what, like in, in, in our case, um, let's see about these numbers 1416, how they can resemble real data. So in our case, uh, the numbers are going to be finite fields. So they're going to be parts of a finite field, which is going to be like a number between zero and this insanely huge prime number. Um, and so each coefficient is going to be a number between these two things. And that's about 254 bits. That's about 31 bytes. So a coefficient with uh, a polynomial with like 4096 coefficients can store about 128 kilobytes by putting the stuff into the coefficients. So, you know, now we know of a way to store 128 kilobytes into a polynomial. And that's kind of interesting because, like, you know, right now rollups, they don't even use close to that number, like maybe they use one kilobyte. So we're basically giving lots and lots of space, maybe even uncomfortably lots of space to rollups to put their stuff in. But this is like the whole idea of 4844. Of course, in reality, we don't put the data into the coefficients and we put them into evaluations and then we do interpolation, but like, whatever, this is not so relevant for this case. The idea is that like, you know, we encode data into a polynomial, and we have polynomials that correspond to a big amount of data, and that's a blob, right? And, you know, then we have KZG, which is what Dankrad was explaining for the past 45 minutes, which is basically like a black box, where you give a polynomial to the black box and spits out a commitment, and the commitment is tiny, and the data is big, so you end up with a situation where you know you end up posting on chain lots of data and then a small commitment. And this is like the, the rough idea. So just to talk a bit about like when this data travels, what the network is supposed to do, you know, like when you see a commitment that, that corresponds to lots of data, what the network needs to do is like they need to make sure that the data corresponds to that commitment. And like the, the, the basic thing to do there, the basic strategy of the verifier to make sure that someone is not like, you know, fooling us and giving us a wrong commitment to other data, which would be catastrophic, is to, you know, like commit to P of X, use this black box again, commit to it, and then check that the commitment that the verifier computed matches the commitment that the guy gave you. So that that's basically a pretty straightforward way to, to verify um, that polynomial matches the commitment. But, you know, 
then we have more data and more commitments. You know, in a transaction, you can have lots of those. In a blob, you can have block, you can have lots of those. And, and that starts being quite expensive. So what we end up doing, because you know, like it's 50 milliseconds to do each of the commitments, so and it scales linearly. So that ends up being quite expensive, <clears throat> especially you know for mempool and this kind of stuff. So in the end, what we're using, we're using KZG proofs and this whole random evaluation trick that Dunkrad taught you before. And basically, um, for each like data and commitment, we also put a proof of a random evaluation. So basically, the proof is a helper that helps you um, do this small verification. I, I don't have enough time to go into the details, but like the idea is that you know. Like the proof tells you that the committed polynomial evaluates to y at z, and then you can also evaluate the polynomial on the left side at z and get some other number. And if the y1 and y2 matches, you're certain that it's the same, that the polynomial matches the commitment. And this is much faster than doing the commitment manually. Um, it's not my intention to go very deep into this. I'm just giving you some idea of how KCG is used in the protocol. So um, I think I'm going to stop here and, and, and stop with the cryptography and pass it over to um, Proto, who is going to go a bit deeper into the actual system. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So let's talk about the blob usage. So with EIP 4 we're introducing a transaction type to make to confirm these blobs in the EVM chain. However, something to note is that it's a new concept here where we are having a transaction type with data outside of the transaction. That's now responsibility of the consensus layer. So it's like a regular EIP 1559 transaction. Then the transaction contains some pointers or hashes, really, that then commit to the uh, the blob data. This is the transaction in a little bit more detail. Something else to note is that it's not RLP but SSC, so it merkleizes nicely and it's better for layer two. And then note here that we have these data hashes committing or to hashing the KCG commitments, which then commit to the film block data. These data hashes are available in the EVM through an opcode, whereas the blob data lives outside of the EVM. So the blob content is, unlike call data, not available in the EVM. Eventually, we can prune this blob data. It's not a long-term commitment to store all of this blob data, but rather we are introducing this blob data just for the availability properties. A layer two needs this data to help users sync the latest state permissionlessly without communicating directly with the sequencer or whichever operator exists on the rollup. And then people can reconstruct the latest state. We, we can have a different solution for retrieving very old states, like a month ago or, a week, or like two weeks ago. So there's the separation of data and the transaction itself. So this is what the lifecycle looks like. As a layer two user, you submit a transaction. Then we have this bundling. As a layer two, we often combine the transactions. So you can pack them, compress them, and so on. This is task for the rollup operator. And then as a rollup operator, you publish your bundle to layer one with this new transaction type. And then in the transaction pool, we have both the transaction that pays the fee as well as the wrapper data with the actual blob content. And then the layer one beacon proposer creates a block and the blobs make their way from the transaction pool in the execution layer to the consensus layer. At this point, the blobs don't get into the execution layer back. Um, it's just the responsibility of the consensus layer. Um, pairs on the beacon chain, they sync the blobs, bundle together with, from, with blobs from other transactions as a sidecar. 
And then the execution payload stays on layer one, whereas the blobs stay available for a sufficient amount of time to secure layer two, but then can be pruned afterwards. So blob data is bounded. This is what it looks like on the network level. We have the layer two sequencer communicating with the transaction pool, the execution engine communicating with the beacon proposer, then beacon nodes syncing the blobs with each other. And then there's the split of the data where the other beacon nodes, they give the execution payload, process the EVM and everything. Fees will be processed by everybody. But the blobs, they are they stay in the contents layer until a layer two node retrieves them to reconstruct the layer two state. So how do rollups work with this? Um, Dankrat already explained the proof of equivalence trick. So I'll give you just a simplified overview how we do this in the EVM. We introduce two new things in EVM, an opcode and a precompile. The opcode simply retrieves the data hash, which is this, this hash that is part of the transaction, just like the hashes in the access list from the Berlin transaction type. It can be retrieved through an opcode, pushed onto the stack, and then there's this precompile, which you can provide with a proof to verify that a certain data at a certain position matches the, the blob content committed to by the data hash. And in the case of ZK rollup, we do so, we use this precompile to do a random evaluation and prove that the data that the rollup is importing is equivalent, equal to the data that the, blobs is inter the blob is introducing. This precompile is versioned, so we can change the commitment scheme. And in the future, I hope we can use it for other things, perhaps uh, Fergal tree verification. Then this is part two. Yes. Can you, can you, can you evaluate that for when the blob, blob has been pumped? Ready? Right, so going back, the proof, all the inputs to the precompile, they're passed in as call data. The blob is completely separate, it's not involved in any of this computation. And so it's just the call data that we're passing in um, with a proof, the index of the point we're trying to verify it, um, the commitment that hashes to the hash that we retrieve from the opcode, and then the precompile will verify everything. Um, similarly, we have the ZK state transition that needs to be verified. This is all ZK rollup specific. Um, up to you to design this. But with the data that's verified and the ZK proof that's verified, we can then get some outputs that we can persist and then use to uh, enable withdrawals. And then this is the version of the interactive optimistic rollups. Interactive op optimistic rollups use this concept called a pre image oracle, where we do not access all the data at the same time, but rather we load pre images one at a time. And by bisecting an execution trace, we only really have to do a proof for a single step, a single execution um, of a, a single like VM instruction. And this might be loading some data. So for example, we start with a layer one block header hash, then we retrieve the full block header as a pre-image, then we retrieve the transactions um, by digging into the Merck tree commitment in the transactions um, hash. And then we can get the data hashes from the transaction. And then from the data hash, we can get the KSD commitment, and then it's not a uh, regular hash commitment anymore, but there's a different type of commitment with the same oracle where we load one point from the blob that is committed to by the blob transaction. And so this way we can load all the data into the fraud proof uh, VM. Okay, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ansgar. I'm going to talk a little bit about 
now that we hopefully in the future will have this functionality, how, how can you pay for it? But also kind of conceptually, basically, um, I mean, the, the Ethereum blockchain is already, you know, kind of pushing its limits, like where's the extra space resource-wise for, for this, basically, where, where does the efficiency gain here come from? Um, and to understand that first, we have to just look in general about like how, do, how does resource, resource pricing on Ethereum work today? So this is just um, kind of my way of thinking about like categorizing the different resources we have, we have on Ethereum. So there's things like bandwidth, compute, state access, memory, state growth, history growth, right? This is all the kind of things, and this is a non-exhaustive non, non list, right? But this is, this is basically the kind of things that actually cause effort for nodes while they are processing um, a transaction. And uh, if you squint at this hard enough, you, you'll notice that, um, that, that there are basically two different types um, of, of resources here. And, um, we, we call those um, basically burst limits and sustained limits. And so burst limits are thing, things where basically they, they, the, they cause costs or incur costs right at the moment that the, that the block, uh, block is propagated, right? The bandwidth to, 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 to propagate a block, the compute to actually verify it, all of this, the, 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 the critical point there is that basically it has to be bounded um, in order for, for blocks to still be propagated um, in a timely manner. Um, and, and also for nodes to be able to, 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 to verify them at all, right? They might run out of resources. And the sustained limits, they don't matter so much block to block. Those are more things that accumulate over time. So that state growth, history growth, these, these kind of things, where like a single block can't really make, uh, like produce too much damage there, but over time it just basically makes it more and more costly to, 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 to run a full node. Um, as it turns out, like if you if you if you look at this, um, there's some sort of, of of structure to this, and you can you can actually reorder this a little bit, and it turns out that usually there's a relatively good matching between like a specific burst limit and a specific sustained limit. So bandwidth and and history growth kind of they correspond, right? Because the bigger a block is, the bigger like the more bandwidth you need to propagate, but then also the more disk space you need to just you know keep it around for for for, for history purposes, and similar with state access and state growth, these kind of things. Um, now specifically for for it for right what we are introducing is this new type of data so uh, kind of the the resources we're talking about here is the, this this first kind of row so it's um it's on the on those burst limit it's, it's the bandwidth how how big can blocks get and then on the sustained limit it's just like how much resource do you need to store kind of the history of ethereum and um, and if you um uh, if you pay attention and if you basically looked into the API a little bit, you already know that like there is this 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 limit um, uh, in terms of history growth. We basically we introduce this new new um, uh, basically uh, a mechanism where blobs are only stored for a single month, and so this is basically why on the history growth side we basically it it, it will it does mean that there will be some extra requirement for node node op operators, um, but it's quite bounded because uh, unless normal history that today is stored forever, but even after there's this nice ERP 4444. Basically, even, even after that, it's, it's still going to be stored for a year. Um, blobs are only stored for months, so basically in terms of sustained limits, it's, it's not basically, it, 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 it has like a very limited impact. The more interesting and also more tricky uh, side of this picture is the, the burst limit, so, so bandwidth. Um, and to kind of understand like what what the situation there is and how 4844 fits in, we have to first remember that today on Ethereum, basically, we only have a single gas price, right? Whenever you send a transaction, you don't actually specify how much bandwidth am I do I want to use, how much compute, how much memory. You just spend said like one gas one gas limit, and then also like how basically how 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 what kind of base fee are you willing to pay for this, right? And it's all basically mapped down into what you you could think about it as like a single dimension for pricing. Um, and that comes with um, uh, uh, basically very real trade-offs in terms of a kind of resource efficiency. So if you if you look at this kind of stylized picture of just looking at two different dimensions here, they could be I don't know data and compute or data and memory or whatever, right? Two different two different dimensions. And basically the way the uh, the, the kind of the Ethereum gas works today, and that's purely for simplicity, right? Because it's very simple to for users to deal with one dimension basically. But the way it works is basically that it is. Um, uh, basically, that, that that those two resources um, um, compete for 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 usage in a block, right? So you could imagine um, if you use if if a block is very full of compute, then there's very little room for, for to 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 put any data in it, or the other way around. And actually, if you if you want to like open Ethers, Etherscan, for example, they for, for every block for the detail detail page, they actually give you the size of the block and usually it's it's something like 50 kilobytes 100 kilobytes but like rarely more than that 
But if you look at what would a log block look like if it was like just full of call data, which is where all the data comes from, if we were, we were all the way, like say, on the, on the lower part of the, of the diagram, if, if resource B was, was data, it could actually be up to one or two megabytes, like, well, two megabytes basically um, of, uh, of size, right? So, so what that means is B basically determined in the past that two megabytes per block are kind of safe um, and, uh, and, and the resource would be there, right? It's basically sitting there, but an average block basically almost like you, you completely underutilizes data. And that is, again, just, just because it's simpler for us conceptually to price these things. So most of the time we are like very far up, up the slope there. And where do you want to be? Like what's, what would be like the most efficient way of handling resources? Well, that would basically be, be, be this picture. So ideally you'd want to basically make these things be independently used, yeah, consumable, where you can basically consume the most amount of, like, the most, the highest safe amount of data that we think you should be, you, like the, the chain can, can manage. But then at the same time, you should also be able to, you know, do still do state access to the, to the biggest, the highest amount possible or, or, or memory or whatever, right? There should not be this, this, this kind of uh, competitive nature to it. Um, and this is basically where 4844 on the burst limit side um, gets, gets its efficiency, right? Because full sharding, uh, full dunk sharding, we'll hear about it a bit more um, um, after this, uh, actually does really clever things where people only sample the data, so bandwidth constraints goes, go quite down, but for 4844, there is no fancy trick, right? Everyone still downloads all the data, so it's very real bandwidth strain. So the innovation on the burst limit side is purely trying to get to this upper right point, trying to actually basically make it so that the existing resource we already have today is just more efficiently utilized. And the way we do this is by going from, as I was saying, like right now today, uh, um, um, pricing is one dimensional. And so what, what we introduced with 4844 is basically we go 2D. Um, and this is how that how that looks like. Um, so this is this is an open PR right now. It's, it's not yet quite much, but um, you can have a look. So like small details might, might still change, but I think the, the general direction is, is pretty set. And so the idea is we introduce what we call data gas. And as you can kind of figure from the name, it's not block gas, it's data gas. The aspiration would be that like maybe in the future we can we can expand this to cover the entire data dimension. But for now it's 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 only used for blobs. And we, we set it in a way where basically like one byte of, of blob will cost uh, one data gas. Um, and this data gas, importantly, basically, is completely independently priced from normal gas. So it has its own 5059 style mechanism where, and that's that's where basically where, where the use, and I, I see Mary is not very happy about this because, you know, like he has to implement it in get at the end of the day. But this is really important for the EIP because other than that, basically, you wouldn't be able to get to this more efficient bandwidth usage. So... Um, what does it look like and how does it, how can you think about it? Well, it's just, you know, similar to how 1559 already looks. So the way to, the, uh, this is courtesy of, of Proto, I stole the slide. And so every column here would be a, a, a separate slot. So the first slot, and, and in this case, basically the, 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 the target amount of blobs would be two. The maximum allowed would be four on a block. So the first block, uh, first block comes in, it has exactly two. So nothing happens. The next one has three, right? The, the red one, it's, it's basically one, one too, too, too many. So the price would go up and then the next two kind of like are stable again and then then one misses a blob so the price goes back down so it's like a very you know like just like 1559 like you 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 know and love it basically um it is a bit different or like it, basically it's 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 it, it, under the hood it, it works a bit differently so here's kind of a bit more more, more look at, at the details here so first of all of course just we have a, a max data gas per block um right just uh, similar to 1559 and, and the target that that is half of that um with transactions, these these blob transactions, they specify an additional max fee per gate per data gas field. So like how much are they willing maximally per data gas um, to, 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 to have that transaction included. Importantly, you know, this does introduce a little bit extra complexity for users, but users in this case are not actually users, those are like big roll-ups, right? So basically them having to specify one more value you know, fine. <laughs> that should, shouldn't like if, if you can't do that, then maybe you shouldn't be in the rock game, basically. Um, <laughs> and and so uh, we just to, to to keep the complexity to your minimum, though we did not uh, opt for having a separate tip for this dimension, so we just reused the the existing uh, existing tip. Um, and then we one thing that we where we deviate from 1559 a little bit in 1559, basically, if the demand were to completely crash, 
theoretically, like one gas could could be could be uh, I think valued as little as seven way, which is just the, the minimum after which basically updates don't don't go lower anymore. But so the transaction would basically be free. We don't quite want basically to make the 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 lowest demand case of transactions here completely free. So we set a, a minimum data gas price that's a, that's kind of at least somewhat meaningful. So that's like ten to the minus five ETH per blob. Um, so of course it's priced in data gas, but it comes down if you if you compute the for the cost of a full block the blob to to that value, um, and the last thing and again this is very technical so like if if you just want to understand conceptually how this works don't don't care about this but but if you ever pull up the EIP and you might stumble across this and you might be confused so so actually the way we we track this um, in fifteen fifty nine right now we we usually track the base fee directly and then we update it every every block and. Um, Actually, it turned out after we introduced it, like looking at it, it's slightly conceptually ugly because we always do these these kind of so basically there's some some properties in the upgrade updating we don't quite love. It's it's a little path dependent and these kind of things. So um, so we moved to to just a, a conceptually simpler way of tracking for this dimension where we we track the excess excess data gas that has been basically been used over the existence of the EIP, right? So basically we just um, we have some sort of target that we want to be used, and then every every block if it basically uses more than that, we just add to this to this counter, and then every block where it basically uses less than that. Uh, but we're still above zero in this counter, we just reduce the counter. Uh, yeah, sure, if you want to. Uh, this is basically a header field, just like the base fee. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this is one additional header field. Uh, which, good question, and actually also, um, uh, I, you can you can see that because I just wanted to give you like an impression of of what the kind of calculating the 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 the, the um, cost looks like with this header field. So um, as you can see, basically we have uh, these kind of mock um, functions. Um, if you want to to get the the, the fee that a transaction actually has to pay, it depends on 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 the header of the previous blocks similar to 1559. Uh, so you first get the the total data gas that the transaction consumes, which is just you know data gas per blob times the number of blob blobs, and then you calculate the Basically, the base fee, but we don't call it base fee because, again, there's no tip, so it's kind of unnecessary to have the base fee tip distinction. So we just call it data gas price. Um, and so, how you basically for, for each block, you once basically calculate its its data gas price, and you do that by um, by basically taking in uh, this this uh, excess um, data gas, and then we use this. Fake exponential function. It's a little nice little tidbit. I don't know. Maybe it's irrelevant, but it's 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 still fun to talk about briefly. So like. Um, just because uh, we want, we want. So, so, so maybe I can, I can already go to the next slide to explain. So basically, this is kind of how the pricing develops. It's, it's like 1559, right? So basically, if you were to continue to just keep, keep basically using up all the data space in a block, not just the target, it would basically be on an exponential curve and would be more and more and more expensive. And you can see basically uh, like a thousand, a thousand excess blobs. That, that's roughly I don't know, some like 10 minutes or so. So within 10 minutes, you'd really like. We have like super expensive uh, blobs if, if it were to, to keep uh, to keep being being fully used. Uh, yeah, Marius again. Um. So no, no, this, the, the nice thing about this is that it's basically a pure function in um, um, in ex excess data gas, right? So it doesn't really matter if it was accumulated at the beginning or at, at the end. Um, there, there will probably be a different, like in the beginning, it will probably be relatively cheap to, to use data gas because the rollups are still kind of adopt, in the process of adopting it, so there's not that much, that much demand. So basically, probably for the first first month or so we'd be like in the very zoomed in left part of this picture and then uh, later on once once it's all basically fully adopted and people use it we'll be like a bit more towards the right in this picture but it's not like this is not a, basically a, a, because it's so reactive it's it's similar to 59 so basically every block can at most uh, do a 12.5 percent update so the difference here like basically you can come you can go from one of these paradigms to the other within five minutes of of of, uh, of, of high usage or low, low usage blocks so it's not like it's not basically something where it matters immensely what in the, what what was done in the in the past basically a, a lot a high consumption in the past only may, means that like basically you have like five five minutes of of uh, reduced blob usage before you're back to your normal price level so it's not yeah so so basically the, the, there's no significant kind of accumulation effect or anything 
right? Right. No, no, but the, the thing is because so 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 the way to think about it is like because the 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 price is a pure function of the excess data gas. So at any excess excess data gas, I mean, of course, I I put down excess blobs just to think about it more easily, but it's tracked in excess data gas. But once you reach something like say. I don't know, a thousand excess excess blobs, that would mean that sending one blob already costs 30 ETH. And that doesn't matter whether the excess blobs were accumulated over w one day or if they were accumulated over a year. So basically, once the excess da the data gas field reaches that value, it would cost 30 ETH per blob to send blobs. So we would expect, of course, that like, rollups are not willing to pay that much for blobs, right? So if for some weird reason there was some spike in demand and the excess would shoot up to that level, it would quickly come back down and, and stay at some, some kind of permanent level. So the excess is not something that will continue to grow over time. It'll just, similar to the base fee, the base fee doesn't just grow over time, it, it just finds its equilibrium value. And of course, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down temporarily, but it hovers around some sort of, you know, 10 to 100 way level-ish. Um, and similarly, the excess, the excess uh, blobs, because that can, can go back down, right? If a, if a block uses less than the target, the number goes back down. So it will just find some sort of equilibrium value that corresponds to, to, to um, some sort of equilibrium price. Um, and it'll just hover around that. Um, yeah, I'll just keep... Keep, I feel like we are, we are out of time, unfortunately, for the, for the <laughs> sorry, fee market section. Um, yeah, come find me after for, for continued questions. So anyway, so basically this is how we, how we uh, make uh, 404 work. History growth, not a big deal. Bandwidth, we really need to put in work to make this work. And the, the, this is kind of where the core innovation of the ERP for now lies, other than that it's forwards compatible with full length sharding. But for now, this 2D, a fee market is really why why we can do this and why we basically just utilize existing Ethereum resources more efficiently. Uh, and with that, I think we are done with the, the kind of the forward for four part of today, and we can move to full dang sharding. Okay, I want to introduce um, uh, now to uh, the two-dimensional KCG scheme, which we will need um, for full sharding. Sorry, this is a big jump. Okay, so when we do full sharding, um, why do we not take all the data that we want to encode and put it into one big KCG commitment? Um, and the reason uh, for that is that uh, that is going to require a super node, like some powerful node that you probably can't easily run at home unless you like um, have a very good intent connection and want to invest some money into it. Um, so we, you will need this both to construct blocks where we're probably like kind of okay with it, um, but we will also need it um, to reconstruct um, the data in case there is a failure. And this is an assumption that um, we want to avoid for validity. So like, um, it's kind of um, more acceptable if a failure leads to just not being able to construct blocks, or maybe we have to make smaller blocks, or we have to um, make blocks without sharded data. Um, but it would be really bad if the absence of the super node could lead to the to a network split where some people think data is available and some people think it's not available. This is what we want to avoid. So what we want is a construction where, yes, like there will be a lot of data in the network and maybe like someone needs to be there specialized into distributing that data. But once they've done their job, the very decentralized network of maybe your Raspberry Pis at home can guarantee that it will always converge, it will always be safe, and so on. Okay. Um, so, uh, what what if we um, what if we just use um, many many different uh, KCG commitments? Just a list of KCG commitments. Um, so, if we do this naively, we just take many commitments and we sample from each, then we'll need a lot of samples because we before had this number of samples, for example, say 30 samples, now we need 30 samples per commitment. Okay, that's that would be a lot of samples. Um, but there's another much cooler way of doing this where we use read Solomon codes again and we ex will extend M commitments for like M actual payload blobs uh, and extend them to 2M commitments. So here's how this is going to work. So we have our um, original data commitments. 
um, in this case, um, three commitments. And what we'll do is we'll define another four commitments that are an extension of these commitments. Um, so they will be completely determined um, by the actual data commitments. Uh, and yeah, so here here's the math of how this works. So what we'll do is we'll define a two-dimensional polynomial um, for the data. And it works the same way as before. So basically we will interpolate this polynomial we will define it by this data region, the original data that def that comes from many different transactions that included sharded data. And um, what we'll say is, for simplicity, I'll just say the row k will just be the evaluation of this polynomial where we set y equals to the number of this row, y equals k. So we evaluate the, row, uh, the polynomial at k, and then we get a one-dimensional polynomial, right? So we get fk of x equals to this and like you can pull up the, all of this together and what you get is again an expression just in the, these powers of x and then we can commit, commit to those polynomials in our normal kzg way okay so we have fk of s equals to this now we replace the x by s and some complicated sum in there but Overall, we have like one elliptic curve element, this black box evaluation. And we call this C of K. Okay, now the cool thing is if you look at this expression as a function of K, then this is also polynomial, right? It's just a sum of terms uh, of powers of K. Okay, so this is very cool. And what this means is that our commitments themselves um, will be on a polynomial. So if we see the commitments, which are now elliptic curve points, as a function of k, they are on a polynomial. So what we have is, before we started with having each row being a polynomial that we commit to, we also have that each row, I mean, this is a property of just a two-dimensional polynomial, each column will be a polynomial, but also the commitments themselves are a, are a polynomial in this case of degree three. Uh, yeah, because they're determined by these four commitments. Okay. Um, so what we have is we'll, the, how the 2D commitment scheme will work is we'll have two, uh, two M uh, row commitments. And um, we can actually verify that this is the cool thing. Like, a, any anyone who validates these commitments can easily verify um, uh, that uh, that they are on this polynomial using a random evaluation trick again, which I introduced earlier. So what we you, what we'll do is we'll take the first a, uh, m commitments, evaluate them at a random point, and we'll do the same for the second m commitments. And if these two result in the same uh, point, actually the point will be, in this case, an elliptic curve point, then they are actually on a polynomial of degree m minus 1. Um, for those who are interested, there is a way to do something very similar um, using uh, uh, 2D commitments. So you can do one commitment to the whole thing, but I won't go into the details here, but um, there are basically some downsides, right, which is why we're not choosing that way. Cool. And so, what, what's, what, uh, why are we doing this? Okay, so we have properties that we already know. Uh, we can verify all samples directly against commitments. Um, there are no fraud proofs required. Um, but now we need a constant number of samples for all these commitments in order to um, get probabilistic data availability. Um, and uh, basically, we get the property that if at least 75% of those samples are available, then all the data is available and it can be reconstructed. And that's the cool thing from validators or other nodes who only observe rows and columns. So there's nobody, nobody in the system will ever need or will be necessary. I'm sure they will exist, but it's not necessary that anyone watches the full square of samples in order to get these convergence properties. Um, so what you'll notice is that this number is a bit higher than before. So like if we only have one commitment, um, then we only need 50% of the samples to be available for the square we need 75%. Um, so the number of samples you'll need to get this will be a bit higher. Cool. And so 
Um, what we get with this um, is that um, I, I made a proposal. I mean, this is all still in discussions, but like one of the ideas how, how we could uh, extend this to a full charting construction is that um, basically the way validators um, uh, use this construction is that they will download um, rows and columns. They will each choose two ran randomly um, of each. And then what we get is um, that if uh, a block is unavailable, it can't get more than one sixteenth of attestations. So automatically the consensus will never vote um, to unavailable blocks. Um, and, um, and at the same time, they can use these full rows and columns that they don't load um, to reconstruct any incomplete rows or columns. So if any samples are missing, they can reconstruct this. And because there will be some intersections, like for each validator, there will be, if they do two, like there will be these four intersections, um, they can see the orthogonal rows and columns um, with the samples that may be missing. And so like, as an example, um, I made a computation that basically with uh, about 55,000 online validators, you get a guaranteed reconstruction where basically every sample will always be reconstructed if like we initially had enough data available to do this. Um, and this day, the, in practice, this number will be much smaller because most nodes don't run one, one validator, but uh, tens and some even hundreds. And data availability sampling, yeah, is basically just uh, checking um, like random uh, samples on a square and um, what we want is again, we want to get um, that uh, the probability that an unavailable block passes is less than two to the minus 30. And if you do the math, you find that you need about 75 random samples to do that. And so the bandwidth to do that in this example, if we do 512 um, byte samples would be 2.5 kilobytes per second, which is really nice low number. Cool. Okay, handing it to Denny. Okay, so there's a lot of math, and there's an elegant construction, assuming uh, th that we can do a constant time amount of work for um, a large amount of data to kind of layer it into it as similar to like a validity condition on our, on our block tree. We don't consider um, invalid blocks in our block tree. We don't consider unavailable blocks in our block tree. And so the, the math and the construction are very elegant, but when the rubber meets the road, um, Data availability sampling on the networking layer is actually a non-trivial problem. That's the wrong way. Oh, the arrow that goes right is so worn, it doesn't look like an arrow anymore. Um, okay, so kind of stepping back, why is this, why are we making this problem hard for ourselves? Um, everyone's seen this. These things are, it's not fundamental that they um, cannot come together, scalability, security, and decentralization all in one system, but it is hard. Um, and it's hard primarily because we want home nodes to be able to run. We want standard computers to be able to validate the system uh, to kind of have uh, security and aggregate even against um, a malicious majority of our consensus participants. Again, kind of in that validity condition of if there's an invalid block and all the validators or miners are saying that's a that's that what is that's what the head is. You say, well, that's not even literally real because it is invalid. Um, and so users in power uh, kind of define what the network is. Similarly, we want to do that with. Um, our bandwidth consideration with respect to um, data availability. So thus, we need to focus on the bandwidth here. Um, a lot of this is a quick recap. We've been talking about this all day, uh, but we need to scale execution. We need to scale data availability. Essentially, rollups give us some sort of like compression algorithm for the execution of transactions, whether it be from fraud proofs or validity proofs. Data availability, we use DAS, data availability sampling or we want to. <laughs> um, data availability, we've been talking about it all day, uh, means no network participant, including a colluding supermajority of full nodes, has the ability to withhold data. Again, this, this it, it kind of makes data availability a validity condition. Um, it is already today, as we noted, you have to download full blocks, but once it's a lot of data and we want those home nodes, it becomes very hard. Um, Right, so again, we want the amount of work to not really scale as those blocks become very large uh, to scale the network. So data availability, assurance the data is not withheld, also assurance the data was published. 
real quick shout out. Doc Red made most of these slides for another talk, and I'm just reusing them. Um, important to note, it's not data storage. It's not continued availability. There's a debate as to how long the network needs to have the data available so that people can check that it was made available. Um, some people say on the order of where are we at? Like 100 seconds. Some people say two weeks. Um, you know, it kind of depends on the use case, and, and it's a bit of a more of a UX debate. It's kind of the onlineness requirement of people to be able to get this security guarantee without trusting, you know, someone else. So, um, is it important? I don't think we need to get into this too much. Optimistic rollups and zk rollups. It's critically important, and you know, who knows? The utility of uh, solving this problem might extend beyond these two types of systems. So networking, the networking is hard. And we probably are making it even harder on ourselves by some of our assumptions here. So we could say, OK, we want, we certainly want to make sure that block producer and consensus nodes, we want to be able to um, not be fooled by a malicious majority. Um, but maybe we have a neutral P2P network, and we can just assume that the P2P network is like healthy and gives us what we want. This is certainly attractive. <laughs> um, it ensures that each node really can uh, see that they get uh, the statistical security. Um, but if we're assuming that the validators can be malicious, it's very high amount of them, um, at least you know, maybe about two thirds. Some people like to say 99% uh, depends on probably the construction on what it, the real one is. Um, then the assumption then that the network, network is neutral is probably not a realistic assumption. So. Well, maybe it's realistic in most scenarios, but if we want to really be able to harden against that uh, majority adversary, we need to be thinking about um, an attacker-controlled P2P network by some threshold, defining whatever that is. Um, again, this is a lot of um, kind of exposition of the problem rather than total solutions of the problem. So, you know, if I'm thinking about designing data availability sampling, um, I'm probably, it's probably, Interesting to think about what's a good neutral network solution, but then I think when the rubber meets the road, we need to think about uh, what thresholds uh, can we actually harden against a very um, attacker-controlled P2P network. Um, so in this model, certainly some nodes can be fooled. And so it ends up being a collective guarantee, again, depending on the thresholds and how this system is tuned. Um, but rather than no node can be fooled, it's probably going to end up looking like no above certain threshold of node can be fooled, maybe for a certain period of time, maybe until the network kind of resolves itself. Um, but so this is likely the correct model, but it does make the problem harder. So the B2B problem, what are we trying to do here? We want this like P2P distributed data structure that can reliably serve samples so that people can do their job of getting the samples. We want low overhead on nodes from multiple perspectives. One, on nodes that are participating in pulling down samples, but also potentially want to leverage nodes that are not just validators, not just builders, in this distributed P2P structure. So we want to also consider the, the overhead of these nodes that are participating in the serving of the samples as well, or in the dissemination of the samples, other things. I want to be robust against attacks. I think one of the really, really scary things here is liveness attacks, um, DOSs, Sybil attacks, et cetera, that are happening on the network layer. Um, because if a majority of nodes are seeing data as unavailable, um, either temporarily or permanently, then they cannot follow the chain at all. Again, we want this to be essentially a validity condition. You know, if there's an invalid transaction in this branch, I don't follow the branch. If that branch is unavailable, I don't follow the branch. So that is a very important, critical requirement, but a very terrifying requirement, meaning that like it is very important that this these P2P structures um, are hardened and, and do we do understand kind of their failure modes, we understand where they where they operate and we do understand how they um, resolve maybe after an attack. Um, and low latency on the order of seconds. I have a um, page of some desiderata we can get into in a second. Um, and there's some distinct challenges, I think, when you're kind of thinking about this problem. Dissemination into the P2P structure, we have a lot of data. How do you efficiently get it into this P2P structure without causing high load on the P2, on the individual nodes of the P2P structure? So you know, if every node only needs 
you know, one one hundredth of the data, but they had to touch fifty percent of the data to get it disseminated in the structure. It's, we're kind of missing something there. Um, similarly, we want to support queries of disseminated data sample for X amount of time, which I can get into this Sutterata again. Um, and <clears throat> validators, certainly uh, with their row and column kind of crypto economic duty, can identify and reconstruct missing data. But we also probably want to consider should this P2P structure be able to identify and reconstruct missing data? So there's two kinds of um, potential reconstruction that we might want. So validators are very incentivized out the gate. You know, if things are missing from the rows and columns, to incentivize to to repair, patch, and make um, make things whole. But if say the um, P2P structure is supposed to serve data availability sampling for one week, then um, are those validators the same people that will then identify and reconstruct missing data, or is there some other more distributed and less timely uh, required method to do so? There's a handful of actors involved in data availability sampling. Um, Francesco is going to talk about builders and where they fit into the kind of the consensus protocol, but they're kind of the original source of the data. Uh, they're highly incentivized to get it out, but they're probably not one that you'd want to rely on uh, in perpetuity. Validators, uh, highly, these are you know crypto economically incentivized actors that we can try to leverage in this construction. They do have the rows and columns. They do also perform data availability sampling, like a user node. And then we have users. Users perform data availability sampling. Hopefully, they can be leveraged in serving and making the whole P2P also um, more resilient itself. Some quick desiderata. Right now, um, you know, if I were thinking about building data available sampling, if I'm researching and uh, doing stuff, I'm, these are kind of some target numbers. But I would also be sweeping these numbers and understanding where they uh, where they work and where they don't. So data size 32 megabytes per block. That's per 12 seconds. Um, or if the slot time were adjusted, it might be per some other amount of seconds, called 16 or 20. Um, but with the 2D erasure coding, that ends up being 128 megabytes of data being disseminated into the network. Chunks, I think we, there's chunks and we sample the chunks or were there samples and we sample the samples. Um, but on the order of 250,000, you can make these larger, uh, but then you end up with, you still need the same constant number of samples, so you end up with more overhead. Samples, he said 75, something on that order, but essentially want to drive that probability down um, as we're doing the sampling. Latency, validators really uh, right now need to make decisions about what they see as the valid and available head on the order of four seconds. That could be tuned depending on the constructions uh, available to us. But they, if they could not regularly be able to do data availability sampling, um, then on the order of four seconds, we have a problem. Users, you could have a potentially lack, more lax requirement on the order of 12 seconds, on the order of a slot. Um, or you could even consider maybe they needed to be doing it on the order of epochs and optimistically following head as available. And maybe there's some play in, in the constructions there. Validator nodes, 100K is pretty optimistic, but uh, we probably have on the order of 4,000 today. Uh, so something on that order is kind of the the, the baseline. Um, and then user nodes on the order of 10 years, especially if we start adding light, lighter weight nodes with statelessness and light clients um, that might want to participate in this data availability sampling. Um, you know, 100K to a million user nodes. You know, so it's really if. The user nodes cannot participate in the serving of samples, then the load on, uh, if we only relied on, say, incentivized actors like validators, then the load would actually scale as the, the, to serve as the user nodes serve. So it's probably very important um, to tie them into the data structure itself. Bandwidth assumption, I don't know. It's probably worth discussing. The eth.org website suggests <laughs> A minimum of 10 megabytes per second around a full node, uh, but but for good whatever, 25 megabytes per second. I don't know who came with that number. Maybe it's a good place to start the conversation. And then persistence. Obviously, like I said, data availability sampling is not for persistence. It's to ensure that data was made available. Where, how, but, you know, data. if data was made available for half a second, like, no one's going to necessarily be able to prove that to themselves that it was made available or a very small subset. So is it two epochs? Is it two weeks? Um, there's much debate here. Ansgar, I think, what was your recent number? Is he still here? 
Okay, okay, 10 minutes in an hour. Whereas I think some are more like a week, two weeks, um, and those that actually changes the requirements on nodes, especially in terms of storage. Um, my intuition here is that the online industry requirement for users that want to get their, you know, state transition changes from ZK rollups or policemen users that want to submit fraud proofs for um, ZK uh, for optimistic rollups, you know, this dictates their online industry requirement. And so I'm, I feel like 10 minutes. Oh man, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So debate. An hour seems short. Um, <laughs> P2P designs. So uh, one easy thing you could do is just say there's a bunch of super nodes in the network, and if you connect to them, you do DAS, and if they give you the samples that you want, then things are available. Um, this is, I believe, Celestia's current design, although that statement I could claim is true a few months ago. I'm not sure today. Um, and you could potentially do something in similar Ethereum, whereas maybe instead of a uh, each node needing to have everything, you could leverage uh, Ethereum validators, uh, the rows and columns that they custodied, um, and it looks kind of similar. Um, this is is nice. Um, you know, if you connect to one on a super node, uh, then you get what you need. Um, but this doesn't really fit well into the node model, especially if validators, you know, a node that's running on the order of one, two, maybe three validators should be able to run on the order of, you know, home resources, um, which is definitely not the case. Um, DHTs. They all of a sudden, uh, DHTs, nice way to distribute data in a distributed data structure across the network. It's a nice way, way to find data um, and seems intuitively like a very good direction or very good start. Um, it fits really well in because each of these nodes can have a very small amount of data um, and really nice scalability as you add more nodes to the network. Um, you can, <clears throat> depending on your redundancy factor, you can have um, you know similar or less uh, data per node. Uh, prone to liveness attacks, it's really easy to civil this thing, uh, naively. Uh, you just make node IDs, you fill the tables, and if you're a malicious node, you can just return uh, entries from your table that are full of malicious nodes. And one thing that's, I think, very promising is looking at secured DHTs. Donkard's been digging into Escadimlia, and I believe there may be some others in this room that have looked at some other papers about hardened DH DHTs. And we do have, you know, we, as long as you have a simple resistance set, then you all of a sudden can have certain guarantees in these constructions. Um, so you can leverage the validator set or maybe other types of crypto economic sets uh, to have hardened DHTs. Um, so you could use standard open DHT for average case performance and maybe a secondary or fallback DHT um, leveraging the validator set for uh, in case of attack. You could also, yeah, there's some weirdness because then all of a sudden you're assuming that you have a certain amount of honest validators uh, for this. Um, so does that suffi suffice under the uh, malicious majority construction? Sure, you can probably tune the numbers, but you could also potentially layer other types of crypto economic sets, um, you know, proof of humanity, uh, spruce ID, whatever the hell, all sorts of stuff, um, and could have layered DHTs where they're ultimately just kind of fallbacks in the event that the, the big main DHT starts failing. Um, validator privacy and optionality and how they construct their node setups is probably very important. I'm definitely over time. Okay, cool, great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Francesco and uh, I'll cover the last bit of this very large topic that we've uh, kind of gone over today. It's proposability separation. I expect probably most people will be somewhat familiar with the concept, but this will be kind of a light um, introduction. Like it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be too advanced. It's going to be just for you to get a picture of how does it fit with dunk sharding and what does it have to do with it uh, in general. And uh, also like uh, kind of how does the roadmap of that fitting in the protocol look like. Um, yeah, so first of all, what is PBS? Um, it's, oh, sorry. Yeah, so there's a, a let's start from the pieces. Uh, we have P, B, and, um, and S. So first of all, uh, block building, the B, uh, is essentially this task of actually creating and distributing uh, execution payloads mainly. So we have beacon blocks, but then inside them there is execution payload, which is the kind of the valuable part in some sense, the 
part that actually changes the state uh, in uh, of the execution layer. And this is the part that is kind of uh, requires some speci specialization uh, to deal with. Whereas the the beacon block part is more of a consensus part. Um, and yeah, so this is um, the normally today we only think about the creating part, like only basically putting together uh, a new execution payload, but uh, the distribution part will also become critical, uh, especially in the, well, in the context of uh, dunk sharding. Um, and uh, yeah, and also uh, this uh, distribute, so the distribution will involve the data that is committed to, uh, which uh, is gonna be eventually very large. So that, that's why it's, it's kind of an important per task eventually. And so for these reasons and well, later we'll get a bit more into them. It's a um, quite specialized activity that we don't really want normal validators to do because it would kind of increase their requirements too much for our, for us to be comfortable with. Um, and then there's proposing. So this is just, um, you could think of, today proposing includes both things, both this kind of consensus part of making a beacon block and including all the consensus messages in it, attestations and other things like slashing messages or anything that's kind of critical to the uh, good functioning of the beacon chain. Um, but then also the uh, putting uh, an execution payload in it. So today it's still possible for anyone to do this by themselves and kind of have both the roles together. Uh, but if we kind of ignore this execution payload part, this is really not a particularly specialized uh, role. And we think that it's always going to be possible to, or we really want this to always be possible uh, with low requirements, uh, basically what we expect today uh, validator to have. Um, and yeah, the separation is just that these two things are split up. Like we don't, um, the default, it would not be anymore that uh, a validator does both things, or the a proposer, which is a validator, does both things, but that uh, the proposer does the beacon block relevant part, the consensus messages uh, part, and uh, some other kind of specialized actor comes in with the execution payload and the distribution of the data uh, eventually. Um, and yeah, so why do we want to do this? I've kind of already well hinted at it but yeah it's it's simply that if, if we outsource the specialized stuff we can keep the simple stuff um basically decentralized we can keep the really consensus critical things um essentially uh, done by a very decentralized validator set um which is a really important goal in ethereum in general um so and i mean practically why you know what are these things that we want to outsource um so there's We've for all the whole day we've been talking about dunk sharding and um, it's not there's nothing really I guess fundamental about sharding that requires um, this outsourcing. You could imagine other models. I mean the I guess original sharding model before the dank part uh, didn't require this outsourcing, um, but it's really like a major simplification and. Um, so, so I mean not not just the simplification also has I think like consequences for latency like um, it just makes the. It, it gives us this really tight coupling between uh, the execution uh, payload, the, the blobs, and kind of um, yeah, just streamlines the whole process. Um, and so, we in, with Dan sharding, if we do want these simplifications, we kind of have to uh, we we start having something to outsource because the proposer has to compute these commitments really quickly, which is uh, not easy to do for uh, like normal hardware. And also, like uh, probably the most prohibitive part is the uh, basically distribution of the data to the network. So that would require like really uh, kind of. Uh, not uh, acceptable uh, upstream requirements for for validators, like more than uh, you know, probably multiple gigabits um, in up. Uh, and so, yeah, we don't want uh, we don't want to require this. It's like orders of magnitude more than what uh, someone would need today, um, because basically the most you might need to uh, distribute is 128 megabytes uh, per block. Um, and uh, yeah, this but again, this is not a kind of fundamental reason if. There was no other reason that uh, we needed the separation for. We might be a bit more skeptical about dunk sharding. We might think, well, you know, we, we don't need these other actors. Why are we introducing them in the system just to get some simplification? That's not kind of the ethos of Ethereum. Like we really want everything to be as um, decentralized as possible, as like resilient as possible. These actors probably, you know, do introduce some complexities in, in this vision. But the issue is, dunk sharding isn't the reason why we, we uh, introduce these actors. The reason is MEV, um, and this is kind of a fundamental reason. There's, I don't think anyone that has looked into MEV uh, enough thinks that there there is any other uh, way essentially to go. Um, and the issue is simply that, as I said, these execution payloads are really valuable, and 
extracting value from them is a really sophisticated activity from many points of view, uh, algorithmic, um, infrastructural, like it requires uh, potentially very good hardware, very, a very good connection, like latency is really important. So there's like all kinds of reasons. Oh, and also like uh, access to order flow. So, um, you know, today we can think that order flow is more or less, um, so, you know, essentially access to mempool transactions is more or less available um, to everyone publicly, but that's, it seems very naive to assume that that's going to be the case in the future, and already it, it's not quite true that that's the case. So maybe there's always going to be a public mempool for censorship resistance reasons, for I mean other reasons, but it's really naive to think that uh, everyone is going to have access to the same uh, kind of raw material to build blocks like the transactions. And uh, this access to order flow is a huge part of, of being able to create valuable payloads. So there's like all kinds of reasons why it's just not realistic to think that um, validators will be able to uh, profitably make their own blocks. Uh, and so there's these really like strong centralization pressures if we essentially don't provide them a way to do it. You just go and you know have someone else do it, well, which is the whole point of the separation, but there's different ways in which it could happen. Some ways in which it could happen are, uh, for example, just everyone staking with pools because that, that's the only way that they can extract value. Um, although that, that's actually kind of not, Already, it seems like a scenario that, in some sense, maybe we can avoid. Uh, we already have PBS today. Like we usually say PBS, and we mean um, basically in protocol PBS, so where the protocol kind of knows about the separation, like has a concept of a builder, and in some sense, like negotiates this um, outsourcing. Uh, but today, we basically have PBS is just not in protocol. It's called a MEV boost. Uh, maybe. Probably a lot of you know it. Um, and essentially, what it does is it introduces a trusted third party in between a builder and proposer, which are these three layers. Um, I don't think I have time to like go into the, the details of it, but essentially, you know, we don't we want builders to not trust proposers. We want proposers to not trust builders. There's reasons for that. Um, and yeah, we just basically put like a trusted third party in the middle, which kind of negotiates the uh, the exchange. Um, so you know, the proposer wants something to build from the builder. The builder wants to get something to the proposer. This, the trusted third party makes sure that the exchange happens uh, in a way where none of the two parties can cheat each other, essentially. And so this already exists today. A lot of the Ethereum blocks are uh, built in this way. Um, so it's it's the reality that and it's not something that you know um, the Ethereum community um, kind of. Uh, made well it is something that the Ethereum community made happen but it's in some sense inevitable like anyone could always build some infrastructure of this kind and people could use it if it's more profitable for them um so yeah so you know we already have this why do we care about potentially putting uh, this separation protocol um so as i said relays are trusted third parties we don't usually like to have these sort of entities in the protocol they're not critical in some sense well if things are set up properly um, which, I mean, I think there's a lot of improvements to be done on the infrastructure that exists today. It's very, um, in, you know, young infrastructure. Um, but either way, there's always going to be some um, kind of uh, failure modes that we don't really like or some some requirements that we don't really like from having these, um, these parties. So one is that you have to uh, basically whitelist them because they're trusted. So everyone has to kind of go and configure some list of these entities that they, they're fine with, essentially, that they trust. Um, and we don't care. If Builders do that, but we don't really like validators to do that. Um, or, well, I don't know, that's debatable, but anyway. Um, there's, I think there's a future for relays to still exist and just have a full fallback in protocol that is not the default, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, but yeah, another thing is that today we don't really have a kind of live monitoring for relays. Uh, like locally, people don't have a chance to uh, observe interactions that relays uh, have had um, with, with other proposers and then disconnect from them if these interactions look suspicious essentially. So that's something that we can include. We can basically really improve the, um, you know, the, the resilience uh, of this whole system because we can make it so that people don't need to, you know, go on Twitter and find out, oh, this relay is malicious, I'm going to disconnect from them, but just maybe this can happen locally essentially. Um, so there's, there's a lot of improvement there. Um, but still, uh, there's some kind of... Um, I guess, really um, fundamental uh, catastrophic scenario that seems unavoidable to me if we keep having, uh, or rather, if we only rely on these entities for this outsourcing, if we have kind of no fallback. Um, so especially um, with dunk sharding, so today you could always have a fallback. Actually, it's not so fundamental to just the state of things today. You, you could always have this fallback, which is 
uh, essentially, the catastrophic scenario is like all relays that uh, most people are connected to fail for some whatever reason. They're malicious or they're attacked. Anything could happen. Um, they fail, and now all of a sudden, today it's fine. You could, you know, once you manage to disconnect uh, because you realize, okay, these people haven't given me blocks for you know however many times I've tried, or if you have this monitoring system, um, that's fine. You just fall back to you you building your own, you know, Geth or whatever like other execution client you're running, building your own blocks. So now we're like this is not really threatened, maybe it's like a temporary thing. Um, but uh, with dunk sharding and also statelessness in some sense, uh, if, you know, let's say all the validators are stateless, they cannot build their own blocks. Um, or with dunk sharding, like they cannot uh, distribute data. Um, then this becomes like a, a threat to network liveness. Uh, with dunk sharding, not exactly. It's like you could make blocks, you just cannot put a lot of data into them. But you could argue, well, is that really liveness? Like if all the rollups can stop because they don't have uh, access to data anymore. That is not really what we want. Um, yeah, so this is maybe what it will, well, this is like the one of the current ideas of what it could look like to put it in protocol. Um, I think, well, yeah, I think probably can't really go into it. Uh, I don't think we have time to go into it in much detail, but basically it looks like you know, as I said before, what are the relays? They're just these kind of actors that negotiate the, the, the exchange. Um, you know, what do we do if we wanna remove these actors? We basically have the protocol negotiate the exchange. Uh, and the protocol in this case is basically uh, other validators. So there's a proposer, there's a builder, and we have the whole rest of the validator set or some committee, um, more, well, likely, um, that basically kind of um, make sure with their, well, they, they observe the exchange and with their attestations, they sort of make sure that uh, if the proposer tries to shoot the builder, um, they, they fail and uh, vice versa, essentially. So it essentially gives us the property, for example, that uh, if the proposer accepts uh, some block and or some some like um, uh, bid, you could say, from, from a builder, and we have good latency, like kind of things are fine from a fortress perspective, from a network perspective, then the proposer will get paid. It doesn't matter what the builder does. If they reveal their block, good, kind of this is a good case. If they don't reveal their block, they reveal it late, you know, tough luck for them, they're gonna pay the validator and not even get their uh, building opportunity. And so this is one design. Uh, there's this other design which is kind of interesting. Oh yeah, also uh, thanks to Vitalik for all of the things. I just took him from many of his uh, E3 search posts. Um, but yeah, like so this is basically, you could say in protocol map boost because it's really like um, designed to look like map boost. Uh, again, we have basically this like party in the middle, this time more clearly than before, um, which is in this case a committee. It also was before, but anyway, and, and this kind of um, party, again, like negotiates, negotiates the exchange. Uh, we could think of the party as basically uh, an availability oracle. So it's um, basically its job is to ensure, it's to give guarantees to the proposer that what the builder sent uh, is available. So the proposer will accept um, a header, like a basically offer of, you know, I want to give you this block, pay you this much, uh, and the builder will uh, essentially uh, erase your code. So, you know, hopefully if you've followed the discussion, you know what erasure coding is by now. Um, the, um, essentially the execution payload to the committee, um, like essentially in encrypt, well, erasure code, then encrypt, and then basically split the parts to the committee so that if some threshold of the committee is honest and online, uh, they will be able to decrypt, even if not all of the committee is. Um, and basically the committee uh, signs, you know, essentially individual uh, members of the committee will attest to the fact that they have their part so that if you see enough attestations and the committee is sufficiently honest, then you know that uh, as a proposer that this thing will be able to be decrypted and uh, you know, the data will be there essentially. Um, so it, it actually, yeah, this kind of fits in quite nicely with these data availability discussions. Like that is really the problem here that um, the proposer is accepting a bid, but the builder doesn't want to say what the bid is because that's their kind of private, like secret information. And uh, we want basically some guarantee that even if you don't know what it is, it, it is going to be there once the time comes, essentially. Um, like once you've accepted the bid and it's ready to go in the chain. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what it looks like. Looks like. Um, and uh, just last quickly, I want to comment on, um, Basically, well, th so there's like censorship resistance questions about PBS. Um, and I think they're not, you know, they're like fairly well understood. There's a, there's clearly like a way that PBS uh, in or out of protocol, so it doesn't really pan, this is like, you know, our questions also today. Um, it, it does the great censorship resistance. Um, but there, we already know kind of how to deal with that. There's this concept of inclusion list. There's like slight tweaks to that. There's, I mean, there's like basically really wide design space of, 
very like roughly uh, said ways for validators or proposers, but you could just say validators to basically uh, make sure that transactions that should go in the chain eventually get in the chain, even if builders don't want that. Uh, and this is also, by the way, like a really important reason why we want decentralization of the validator set, because if you don't have that, then you just don't have this option. Like if you have 100 validators and they don't want something to go in the chain, that's it. There's no way, well, I mean, there's ways like soft working or, you know, other reason, other ways, but there's no kind of automatic way to, to, to do that. Whereas with a decentralized validator set, we can always do that. Um, and yeah, so inclusion lists are quite simple in some sense. Um, there's like disagreements about how exactly they should work, but they're sort of simple today. So if we have like the property that it is easy for a validator to say this transaction is uh, available and this transaction is valid. Um, so the validity part becomes a bit harder with account abstraction. So there's some questions there, but we won't go into that. That's not really relevant here. Uh, the availability part, that becomes a bit harder with dunk sharding because now all of a sudden, you know, there's all this like, all these blobs floating around the network. There's all this data that you're not supposed to uh, know. You're not supposed to essentially have, uh, download all of. Um, you're only supposed to sample what actually ends up. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll just finish this phrase and then <laughs> I guess that's it. Uh, but yeah, basically, um, with uh, yeah, so with uncharting, uh, determining availability becomes a bit harder. So we would like to have uh, some kind of sharded mempool construction so that you can even for things that have not been included in a, in a block yet, you can still in some way determine that they're available uh, without everyone having to download everything essentially. Um, and at, the point, at this point, uh, and in this might not need to be the default route that all transaction goes through and probably won't um, for kind of the sum of the reasons that I've already hinted at before. Like it's, it's unreasonable to expect that everything will go through a public mempool, but this is kind of the fallback for censorship resistance always. And so we want to basically have some kind of construction like this. Um, and I think that's it. We're out of time. Hopefully, maybe we still have time for some questions for everyone. Um, yeah. But otherwise, that's it. OK, so we are obviously out of time. But uh, we can still use this room for another uh, 20 minutes. We have a special guest here, Vitalik, is here to answer some questions around it, of it. Uh, OK. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, okay, there's a question. Hello, thank you. How do you approach the, the topic of multi-rely in this uh, time sharing like ecosystem? Because there are many solutions. What do you mean by multi -rely? Um, because I heard in PBS, but that it um, weakens the, um, the topic of censorship. But how do you how do you approach the um, yeah, to improve the mempool with um, multiple multiple relays? Of so information? relays are a concept that exists in like MevBoost kind of out of protocol PBS, right? Like it's not a concept that exists in in protocol PBS. So the long, right? So the long term solution is to, I think to not need to rely on them. Mm -hmm. Hi, the erasure coding and Shamir's secret sharing scheme seem very related. Is they that, are. They're the correct? exact same math. Okay. <laughs> is is network persistent uh, for the blob? Is it going to be dependent on finality? Because I would have expected this to be the case, and therefore rule out completely these notions of having them for only five minutes. Well, what do you mean by dependent on finality? Like that, if we're not finalizing, then we need to keep the blobs for longer. No, well, oh, I see. Well, so like if you're in the middle of an inactivity leak, that probably makes sense. I mean, I think uh, like I personally favor blobs being around for long enough, like, you know, a month, like at least a month or so, so that, uh, you know, any, like it's longer than any re realistic inactivity leak that would happen, but you no, know, there's different approaches. Okay. Uh, just on the setup 
was there like a consideration or is it even possible or what's the problem with actually making that like a separate system? It reminds me a bit to like Swarm as it was integrated into Ethereum nodes. Like, wouldn't it be possible with pre-compiles and like the right new EVM opcodes actually make that an independent system or? So the problem, the reason why we need like data availability sampling in consensus and why it's like so different from, you know, IPFS and everything out there is because we want to act, like actually have consensus on the fact that the data is available, right? Like the yeah, like IPFS does not provide that, right? And there's ways to like upload files so that some people think it's available and other people think it's not available. And for like regular file publishing, that's fine because if it's ha if a file is half available, you just publish it again. But for rollups, like it, you need like exact cons like global agreement on which data was published um, on time and which data was not published on time because the yeah rollups uh, like in order to figure out the current state of a rollup, you need to figure out like which uh, data blobs to include and which ones to skip over. Uh, yes. And uh, tightly coupled with the chain. Okay, next question mm -hmm. here. Hi, for the sort of data uh, blob storing period, are there any thoughts about like challenges for validators that kind of keep that data or is that purely altruistic behavior? There, I mean, there have been proof of custody designs that we've worked on over the years. I think it's kind of, it's on the sort of rhetorical back burner because we just like know that these techniques exist and like we know that when the time comes, you know, we can probably just stick them in to get extra security. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask about the multidimensional fee market quickly. Um, I, we talked about this excess data gas field. I was just wondering if uh, the same would like in an ideal world, if we hadn't already done EIP-1559, would the same construction uh, be wanted for the like original kind of gas? Yes. Yeah, and but this can happen simply just, yeah, could I this mean, happen? EIP-1559 could be upgraded to that over time. Okay, cool. So I, I think there are even already thoughts in that direction. So I think over, long, over the medium term, we would want to. And one of the nice side benefits it would give us that it also makes other improvements to to a fifteen fifty nine like mechanism easier. Like for example, like a time based instead of a block based um, kind of throughput targeting. So yeah, we would probably want to homogenize this over time. Yep. So um, I could be wrong on one of these assumptions, but my understanding is that proposer builder separation was motivated largely by the um, centralizing effects of MEV and us wanting to keep the proposer set decentralized um, but then kind of later with these designs like full sharding we realized that we could utilize the builders as kind of um, with extra hardware requirements because they'd be incentivized with the MEV that they're extracting to have these nodes but mm -hmm. then there's also research into completely mitigating MEV uh, Okay, so maybe that's the wrong assumption. Well, okay, there, there's multiple strands of research, and some of them are definitely sort of covering for each other in case the other fails, but and some of them are complementary, right? So there's a PBS, which uh, allows proposers and validators to be more decentralized, but at the cost of kind of shifting that centralization to builders. There's a separate strand of research on the topic of trying to make build, like builders themselves uh, decentralized internally. Um, so like a some kind of protocol would plug into the market and make bids instead of being a single actor. And then there was also research on making applications that are MEV minimized. So like all three of those exist. Okay. I guess the question is just simply like if we mitigate or very minimize MEV, then how do we incentivize It's just like builders? minimizing MEV doesn't mean MEV goes away. It just means we do as much as possible to reduce it, but there's no, sure. I, I, again, like I think anyone that has thought about MEV for some time uh, will come to the conclusion that it's just not possible to assume that there's not going to be an incentive to be a specialized actor. Like there's, even gotcha. if all transactions are encrypted, there's always going to be some reason to be the first to, to touch uh, this state. Like, you know, okay. so, so the idea is they'll still be incentivized to run these nodes. Yes. Okay. There's always going to be, I think a lot of money to be made by uh, controlling a block. I don't think that if Ethereum is uh, a platform with value flowing essentially. Right, and just to, to briefly mention, it's not just dunk sharding, where basically a PBS-like architecture would help. So once we move with worker trees to some to a world where it's uh, easier to run stateless nodes, 
Um, then also with, with what PBS would get, get us would be that like va normal validators would basically all of a sudden have like way way um, um, lo lower um, um, storage requ requirements, and we only we, we don't don't get that if they still have to create blocks because then they need the state. But if you only actually validate but you don't create your own blocks, you you give you, you leave that to to a specialized entity, then you can um, as a validator turn stateless, uh, and that's kind of the one more of these benefits we would get out of this. Sorry. Wouldn't it make sense to like uh, charge for sampling or something like that to like motivate people to have the data and be able to collect the charges? I mean, I think it's definitely a possible construction. You could like uh, see a way like where you have oops, a specialized sample provider and you pay them. Um, I think like the downside is that it makes it much harder to run a node because now you need to somehow set up this payment infrastructure. So um, I think it's not ideal, but it's possible. And next. Hello. Will there be ways to um, for an, for uh, somebody who wants to make data available to provide a proof through a smart contract as well, uh, which is independent of uh, this call data layer twos and so on, which is uh, smart contract specific, like as a generic infrastructure for proving that data was available? I mean, that's that's what this construction does. Okay. Like this is part of like you. There will be a type of transaction that uh, is called with a KCG commitment. Mm -hmm. And with the guarantee that this data is available, and then also being, um, do the, does there need to be like a special opcodes in solidity to to run the proof then to will uh, to check that it was actually provided? Because that no, doesn't, the no? data was like if you get that commitment, it was provided. Yes. Full stop. But if it's there's not, no extra check necessary, yeah, that it was provided. But then if uh, let's say somebody wants to have a check inside solidity if the data was available but for... it's a parameter it's just like you so, get this commitment and you know it's there it's like extra so data if you want to check that the data is available behind a commitment you use a history proof to prove that that commitment was any transaction in some case okay okay mm -hmm. any other questions So one way to understand a data availability sampling network, uh, can we fix it, basically interpret it as kind of like a dedicated IPFS, but with, with the samples that distribute in the network and the validator sample it, um, but definitely IPFS has some. IPFS is a very bad way to think about it yeah, because yeah, what I, we're I doing is not storage, it's proof that data was not withheld. Um, yes, but I, I just like, um, Kind of like for the network perspective, like, um, yeah, I, and I know IPFS is vulnerable to civil attack. Yeah. That's something that is going to be addressed. A, I, mean, I think, yeah, from, from the kind of network perspective of how the thing should be yeah, implemented, like this thing has much higher requirements in terms of Byzantine fault tolerance yes. and in terms of real-time access and like real-time mm -hmm. real time being able to change what you're accessing. Yeah. Those are probably the biggest differences in requirements. Okay, great. Next question there. Metallic, if you don't mind, uh, have you enjoyed your stay in Colombia so far? Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, 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 I, I, I have. It's, uh, it's been very fun. Thank you. Thank you. Um, something I was thinking about is that if so, we um, we assume that MEV exists and that people want to um, you know sandwich other people's transactions and stuff like this. So we we have this proposal to build a separation, which makes a lot of sense, and then we. Once we have this, we kind of start to utilize it to do heavier work, like thank sharding and things like this. One of the things I'd be concerned about is that um, presently we have the ability for users to just simply not run MEV and they just let the transactions come in as they will and they you know, lose a bit of money, but they're kind of genuine people. I'd just be interested to make sure that um, we don't rule out this person and we don't kind of glue together the role of like making really specialized fancy um, sandwiching blocks and then also doing all of the dank sharding stuff. I mm -hmm. think it'd be nice if we can make sure that we keep a space for the home home user to continue to pack their own transactions and just mm -hmm. be like, you know, a nice guy. Oh, go. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, no. This is um, actually one of those things that I, yeah, I think I wrote an ETH research uh, post about last week, right? Like, basically, yeah, like, can we, yeah, push 
the autonomy in choosing uh, block contents uh, back to the proposer. And like, that's a spectrum that potentially could go all the way up to the proposer having an option to make everything. And then one of the conclusions there was that if we want to of that kind of proposer autonomy property, but also have the uh, uh, the property of like potential low proposer requirements. We might need to have a third category of actor that does that are kind of not and not MEV extraction that in basically the, the entire bundle of computationally expensive stuff. So like uh, witness addition, state root calculation in the future, uh, ZK snarking and uh, you know, uh, fig, like, figuring out polynomial commitments and proofs and broadcasting and so forth. I mean, I, I just want to comment. I think like people need to stop thinking of MEV only as a bad thing because you think of sandwiching and even without any front running, any sandwiching, we still have lots of MEV and it's actually a necessary part of the system. Like someone needs to do the arbitrage on the exchanges. Someone needs to do the liquidation. Someone needs to submit the fraud proofs. All of these are MEV. So don't think like is this is a, we're incentivizing a bad thing here. So it's it's a part of the systems we're building. And, but I mean, you. So for, I would say, for example, you can eliminate um, the bad MEV using transaction encryption, for example, but you'll still have loads of MEV left. Like, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. I think, uh, well, but basically, like we're relying on ethical builders. I think there's like all kinds of techniques that we're layering on top to limit the power that uh, builders have to do like the yeah, really nasty things. A question on the PBS. So uh, here, <laughs> uh, so we, we, we like sort of apply some slashing mechanism once we have a separation between the builders and the uh, Proposers, I sort of um, different actions they probably have. Yeah. So there are slashing mechanisms, like there are different slashing mechanisms at play, right? So like there's a slashing mechanism that slashes the proposer if they make two conflicting mm -hmm. blocks. In some of these partial block auction protocols, uh, we use eigenlayer, and that's like basically exposes the proposer to kind of extra slashing if they uh, so if, if they violate the uh, rules of the partial block auction protocol. Uh, builders can uh, get uh, slashed in uh, some uh, some contexts. I mean, for, forget exactly yeah, which ones, but there's uh, a de definitely a few cases. Um, so. Yeah, there, there's definitely like different uh, forms of uh, of slashing to make sure different the, the different participants follow the rules of the protocol. Yeah, thank you.